And today, on this Easter Sunday, uh, I have the great privilege of sharing a message with you. We've been focusing this Easter season uh, on the theme, um, the final word. Everybody say the final word. And today, I'm not, I usually come, you guys know I'm usually teaching something and kind of bringing a song in a series, but today I just really feel inspired to come and, and just build our faith and encourage us with a message based on that theme, the final word. Don't you love the word of God today? Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. I want to begin by looking at this scripture this morning. It's in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. And here's what that word says. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. He said, I am the living one. I died, but look, I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. Praise God, praise God. Come on, I want us to read it just one more time. Jesus talking in the vision to John in Revelation, identifying who he is. John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I'm the living one. That's the part that gets me going right there. Jesus said, I'm the living one. I'm the one who was dead. He said, I died, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and the grave. He has the final word. Amen, everybody. Y'all pray with me and pray for me this morning. Father, I just love you and thank you, God, for my opportunity today. Lord, to share and come and just remind people this morning of what your word says about you and your resurrection. Father, this morning, I just pray for hearts to be changed. God, I pray for somebody today. If somebody's here today and they, they're far from you and they don't know who you are, maybe they've walked away from you and your call in their life, God, I pray that today is the day of restoration. Today is the day of salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving us your word because we love your word. We need your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. One more time, guys. If you're excited that Jesus is alive, let's give him a big clap of praise, everybody. Come on, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I want you to look at this, this slide right here in this little statement. We're going to hang out on this slide for a little while. The one who defeated death gets the final word. Come on, everybody say that out loud with me. Ready? One, two, three. The one who defeated death gets the final word. And not just the final word on some things. How many know this morning he gets the final word on everything? He gets the final word on everything because he defeated death. And he's the one who defeated death. And so have you noticed that we live in a terribly skeptical society. Maybe you know somebody who's questioning everything all the time. We live in a society where people have conditioned themselves to question everything, especially when it comes to matters of faith and great belief. The truth is this morning that people everywhere, most of us in our former life before we decided to, to follow Jesus, but people everywhere desperately want to have the final word in their own lives. In other words, they want to be in control. Church, people may desperately want to save themselves, to, to be in control. They, they're searching and looking and trying to have the final word on everything, trying to figure it out. Really, what there's, what's going on there is they're trying to save themselves. They're trying to find joy. They're trying to be liberated from that guilt and that shame of their sin. But even they're trying to be free, free themselves from the consequences of their choices most of the time. 
Church, but hear me. On this Resurrection Sunday, understand this, everybody. There is a universal truth that will stand forever, stand against this tide of deception that rips through this skeptical society. And that truth is this. And I'm here to declare it this morning. There is only one who has the final word. And he, he's the one who can look at you and say, I was dead, but now I'm alive. The one who has the last word on everything is the one who can stand before you and say, you know what, look at me. I used to be dead, but now I live again. And I hold the keys to death and the grave. Come on, somebody. Praise God. How many realize when you come out of the grave, you got the final word? How do we know that he has the final word this morning? When I read the word of God, I see these accounts of, of what took place during this incredible day in history. On Matthew chapter 28, for example. And you guys know the story. Women came to the tomb to check on Jesus' body. Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, certain other women, the mother of James and John. Mary saw that the stone had been rolled away. And so they ran to tell the disciples and while they were gone, other women showed up at the tomb. And you, you guys have read this many times. The Bible says they didn't find Jesus' body, but they did find an angel sitting there. And that angel said to them, don't be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here. He is risen. Then he told them, go back now and tell the disciples and Peter that they'll find Jesus in Galilee where he awaits to meet them. What a story. See, he has the final word this morning, church, because he was, past tense, he was in the tomb, but now he's out of the tomb. Come on. He's not here. He is risen. That should excite us this morning. Come on, everybody. We need to understand that because he's risen this morning, he's got the final word, and that means that, you know what? He's not done. It's not over till he says that it's over. He has the final word. In John chapter 20, Peter and John had heard the news that Jesus' body was missing, so they too ran to the tomb, the Bible says. And when they got there, John stooped down to peer inside the tomb of Jesus, but he didn't see Jesus. The Bible says in this story, all he saw there was the grave clothes. And that lets me know this morning that Jesus has the final word. Because had Jesus' body been taken by the Romans or by the Jews, they would have lifted his body and carried him away with his grave clothes intact so that no one would suspect that he had risen from the dead. But here was Jesus' death linens on the floor collapsed in a pile. Can you see it this morning? See, no one in a hurry to steal Jesus' body would have taken the time to undress his body and leave the evidence behind. No, that's not what happened. Here's what happened. Jesus got up, and he meant to let everyone know that he had the power of life and death, so he took off those grave clothes and left him right there for everybody to find. Come on, somebody. He has the final word in Mark chapter 16. Mary Magdalene, again, returning to the grave. The Bible says that she saw a man there, and she assumed that it was the gardener. And we have this incredible scene. She was weeping over grief because of Jesus. And all of a sudden, it wasn't the gardener. She heard his voice that was so familiar to her ask her this question, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? And before she looked up, the Bible says that Mary said, Sir, tell me what you've done with him, and I will go, and I will take him away. She didn't yet realize that it was Jesus. And Jesus simply said to her, Mary, and he said her name. And when she heard the tone and the love and the tenderness of his voice, the Bible says immediately she knew that it was the Lord, and all she could do was turn around and say, Master, Rabbi. This morning, Jesus has the final word in this story. Because just a few days prior to this story, this particular woman was weeping and crying and cleansing the wounds of a dead man. But now that dead man's not dead anymore. He's standing in the garden saying, Mary, here I am. He's standing there talking to her. Praise God, praise God. 
In Matthew 28, the Bible says that the Jews, watch this, the Jews assembled together and they decided to pay off the guards to tell the lie and say that the disciples had come while they were sleeping and stole Jesus' body. In other words, they're trying to cover up the evidence that Jesus had actually risen from the dead. Come on, somebody. He has the final word because had he not been risen from the dead, the people would have to try to pay him off and lie about it. Come on. We may live in a skeptical, skeptical world, which we do. But there is one thing that all people can be sure of this morning, and I just want to remind you right now and build your faith of this truth right now. History, tradition, academics, intelligence, doubt, even fear can never veil the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how hard they try, what philosophy or vain ideology they pump into your life or into the life of your school or your kids or today, even your government, you can't change the truth that he was dead and now he lives. He's alive and he has the final word that lives can still be changed, that hearts can still be mended. Come on. He's the first and the last. He's the one who was dead, but now he is alive. Praise God. Praise God. If you believe it this morning, give him a clap of praise this morning right now. He is alive. That means today that when you're facing the kind of trouble and the kind of obstacles in your life that drain you of hope, and I've been there and so have you. But when you're facing those kind of scenarios, you don't know what to do, you don't know where to turn, you don't know who to talk to, where to go, you don't know what your next move is, he has the final word. It means you can trust that he is alive to engage you in your situation and oversee your circumstances and get the final word concerning your outcome. Aren't you glad about that right now? I'm so glad that he's alive because there's so many instances in my own life when I didn't know what to do or where my hope was coming from. But Jesus, the alive Jesus, not the mythical Jesus. I'm not talking about a story time Jesus. I'm talking about the man who was dead and now can meet me in my prayer and say, son, I love you and I'm watching over you and I'm going to engage your life right now and turn this around and adjust your world so that you can come out on the other side giving me glory and praise. It means there's still hope for the hopeless. He's the first and the last. That means to us this morning is simply this, that when you've got something in your past, something that continues to haunt you and harass you, and that's me, it's you, sometimes it's everybody in here. We all have remorse and regret that the enemy tries to browbeat you with. But it just means when something is haunting you and harassing you, Jesus is alive to stand on your behalf as your advocate with the final word, his word, concerning the status that you have as someone who's been forgiven. And now you can no longer, because of his shed blood and his resurrection, you can no longer be condemned over that thing you did or that person you used to be. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited this morning. I'm just thankful that he's alive. His resurrection right there means that forgiveness is always available for the sinner. And if you're here this morning and you need to experience the forgiveness of God, all it takes is just going to him and saying, Lord, I believe you and I trust you and I want you to forgive me. And you know what? He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you and make you brand new. His resurrection means that there's always going to be a father for the fatherless. There's always going to be bread for the hungry. Always going to be healing for broken bodies and broken minds and broken spirits. And his resurrection this morning means that there's always going to be a path to heaven. They can't cover it up. They can't lie about it. They can pretend that it didn't happen. They can't hide from it and they cannot deny it, church. Jesus died on a bloody, murderous cross. And three days later, he demonstrated the power and the fullness of the resurrection power of God by reawakening. Breath re-entered his nostrils and he reawoke. Come on, somebody. What happened? Well, his spirit quickened that once dead flesh. And breath swept into that cold, dark tomb that day and filled his lungs once again. And your word tells you that he didn't stay there, but he got up. 
He got up dismantling that death garb and left it right there on the floor for people to find it. Then he took the time to carefully take that death garb and he cleaned, he wrapped it, and he placed it there for somebody to find. In that same body, scars and all, the one that they had cleaned, the one that they had wrapped in that borrowed tomb, that body stood up and it walked out of that grave, demonstrating that he was the one. He's the one. He's the one who can have final word in your life, in your circumstances, because not even death can stop him. Y'all ain't hear me this morning. I said not even death can stop him. Your Bible says he walked out of the grave and he spent 40 days revealing that not even death can stop the plan of God, the power of God, and the love of God. Come on, somebody. Just a few more examples this morning that he has the final word. Because in Luke 24, the Bible says he appeared to Peter after the resurrection. And y'all know the story. Peter had denied that he knew Jesus three times. Peter needed restoration. And the Bible says that Jesus restored him personally and privately after Peter had denied even knowing him three times. He has the final word. In Mark chapter 16, he appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They didn't recognize him until supper time, the Bible says, when Jesus broke and blessed the bread and immediately they remembered, the, the word says, that same burning in their hearts from previous experiences that they had with him. In John chapter number 20, your scripture says that he appeared to 10 disciples and he showed up and said, peace be unto you. And the Bible says that they thought they were looking at a ghost, but Jesus had to explain it to them. You're not looking at a ghost. He said, you know what? Spirits don't have flesh and bones like you see that I have. And he invited them to touch him and feel his body and convince them that it was really him. And the Bible says joy rose up in their hearts and they took him aside and they fed Jesus some broiled fish and a honeycomb. Sounds pretty good this morning. Amen. Later in John 20, your word says that he appeared to some other disciples and Thomas was among them. How many of you guys remember the story of doubting Thomas? Thomas was a lot like the skeptical people in our day. Thomas said, you know what? I have to see him and feel it for myself before I believe that he's actually risen from the dead. So the Lord did something spectacular. He invited Thomas to put his fingers in the holes that the nails had left in his hands. He said, here, put your finger here and see that it's really me. He said, Thomas, put your hand in the hole in my side where the soldier had pierced me from the side. Put your hand in here, and I'll go ahead and prove it to you that I am who I say that I am. Jesus has the final word. And he told Thomas something so amazing. And this is where you and I come in this morning. Here's what he told doubting Thomas. He said, Thomas, you have believed me because you've seen me. But there are those coming who won't have the opportunity to see me resurrected in the flesh before they believe. So blessed are they who, though they have not seen, yet they will believe. By the way, that's me and you this morning because we've never seen him physically with our own eyes. But you know what? You don't have to see him with your physical eyes if you know what he's done for you in your life and in your heart. If you know that the blood of Jesus in his resurrection has changed you from the inside out, you don't need physical evidence. You got all the evidence you need right in your life. Come on, somebody. He has the final word because of John 21. The disciples in this story were so discouraged, and they were fishing because Jesus appeared to them on the shore, and here's what happened. He called out to them, and he said this. Look at your word. He said, has anyone caught anything? The Bible says they've been toiling and fishing all night long, and they had not caught a single thing. So Jesus said, hey, put your net on the other side of the boat. And all of a sudden, they caught so many fish that they couldn't even bring in the net. 
And when after that miraculous catch of fish, John recognized that it was the Lord, and he said to the others, hey, it's the Lord. The Bible says that Peter got so excited to see Jesus that he jumped in the water and swam all the way up to Jesus. And when they got to the shore, Jesus had already been over there preparing a fire with hot coals to cook some fish for breakfast. Praise God. He has the final word. Let me just mention a few practical reasons. Some right now reasons why he has the final word in our life in this room right now. Some of you have been there. If we were to look around, we would clearly see that he has the final word all around us every day. When there is a sweet, precious, broken-hearted, abandoned wife, a woman. Maybe she's been left alone. But somehow God does a work in her life and she finds the strength and she finds the faith to carry on and rebuild her life. That scenario means that Jesus had the final word in her life and she can rise up and go forward. Come on. Maybe there's an addict, someone who has become chemically dependent upon substances. And he finally puts his faith in Christ and allows God to supernaturally set him free. In that moment right there, it means that drinking and drugs and substances don't get the final word. Jesus gets the final word. All of these moments when the husband and the wife have a marriage that's been through so much And now they're plagued with strife and with discontentment. When they come together and finally decide to trust Jesus together and make his word their standard, and now their marriage is being mended and God's being glorified, that means that right there in their situation, Jesus is getting the final word and the world is not getting the final word. Can you see it this morning? I want you to see it. Every day, all over this world, when precious, lost, and discouraged people Discover that there is still hope in the presence of Jesus. He gets the last word, somebody. When the hurting hearts of those people who are grieving because they've lost loved ones in their family, when they allow Jesus to heal them and his spirit to comfort them and they find the courage to go forward, that means he's got the final word. Every day when sinners people who are struggling. Every day when they come to the cross of Jesus and they trade their shame and their guilt for the joy and the freedom of knowing who he is and what he's done, that church is him getting the final word. Can you receive it this morning? And he has the final word in your life. When he's given you a reason to live, when he's given you a reason to breathe, a reason to believe, it means that, listen to me, it means that all the stuff that tried to break you in your life cannot have the final word over you. Jesus gets the final word in your life. Can y'all receive it today? Pastor Jason, join me. His resurrection means that he is the first and the last. The one who has defeated death and the grave. And guys, that means Jesus gets the last say. The final word in just so many areas. And I want to point out four real quick. Watch closely. In our lives today. Number one, he has the final word over our sin. He has the final word over our sin. Romans 5 and 6 says this. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Praise God, praise God. What does that mean, his final word? Through his sacrificial death, through his resurrection, Jesus, hear me out, guys. Jesus dealt the decisive blow to sin. And when he rose up from the grave, he broke the chains of sin that bound us. Offered us that great gift of redemption and reconciliation with our Heavenly Father. That's what he accomplished for us. When he came right out of that grave. Number two. He has the final word over death. Sometimes I talk to people and they're afraid 
of dying. They wonder what's on the other side. It's a huge struggle in a lot of people's hearts because, man, we live in a world that just pumps atheism and all this disbelief and everything, and, it's, and everybody is struggling with it in their conscience. Because they don't want to be accountable to a creator, but they look around and their conscience tells them that something's got to come from something. And it's a struggle. But Jesus has the final word over death. Something's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. 1553 of 1 Corinthians. Look closely. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Praise God. His resurrection stands today as the ultimate triumph over death itself. In our darkest hour, when all seems lost, Jesus emerges victorious from the empty tomb. His resurrection today means for me and you that death has no power over those who believe in him. Praise God, because he's the, he's the one that can look at you and say, Check me out. I was dead. But now I'm alive. And I hold the keys. Praise God. Praise God. Number three, he holds the final word over your present. That's your right now. If you're born again today, he's in control. You have to spin your wheels trying to create your own outcomes. Let me tell you, do your best and please the Lord. But you better believe he's in control. And his plan for you is to have a blessed life that you can be a blessing. Look at 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. That means he's created you all over again. Those who you believe, that means he, you're born again. He's given you a brand new heart. He's made you a brand new person. And look, to a living hope. Praise God. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Praise God. He has the final word over your present. If your life and your days are plagued by brokenness and despair. His final word reminds us that no matter how dire our circumstances may seem, there's always hope in Jesus. He's still the source of everlasting hope. Restoring our broken hearts, renewing our strength. So church, we cling to this hope. Knowing that all things, in Him, all things are possible. No matter what. And finally today, the, He has the final word, not just over your present, He has the final word over your future. And more specifically, your eternal future. John 11, Jesus speaking. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. He has the final word over your future. His resurrection assures you of the promise of eternal life. Just like Jesus rose from the dead. When you believe in him, your word says you too will be raised to a new life with him. I'm so thankful this morning that that promise sustains us through life. All of life's trials and struggles. That promise compels us right into our ultimate destination in the presence of our, of our Heavenly Father. Jesus did this. He did it for me and for you. And He has the final word this morning. 
We can't try to convince ourselves that we have got the final word. Jesus did it. He said, I am the first and I am the last. I'm the one who was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys to death and the grave. He's alive. Praise God, praise God. Will you bow your head for just a moment? Don't want to miss an opportunity this morning to pray with somebody who may be making a decision to, to believe Jesus. I will say it one more time. He has the final word in your life. The life I've been describing begins at the cross and begins when you decide to choose to believe Him. Guys, I want to pray for you. Can't think of a better moment right now than Easter Sunday morning for you to make a decision to serve Jesus. He's the way. He loves you and he did all this for you. Nobody looking around. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I know we have guests here this morning. I'm not going to embarrass anybody today. But I want to tell you this. If I can pray for you today and say, Pastor Brandon, I'm choosing Jesus right now. I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of not knowing where my faith is going to go and how things are going to work out for me. And I'm ready to believe. Pray for me that I'll serve him from now on. If that's you guys, will you just slip your hand up and let me see you guys and let me know I can pray for you. Anybody else? I see this hand. Everybody's praying, guys. What a moment, guys. Thank you, Lord. Y'all stand with me, guys, all over the room. Hey everyone, Pastor Kevin here, and I'm so excited that you came to worship with us today. My prayer is that something in this service, whether through worship or the Word, changed you and gave you hope for the week. If you'd like to share that opportunity with us or whatever's happened in your life, there's a QR code that's going to appear on the screen. Just scan that code and it'll take you to our Connect card. We'll connect with you and you have chances to leave all kind of notes or prayer requests that we can gather together and pray with you about throughout the week. Thank you again so much for worshiping with us. We hope you have a great day.